Today I'm at the Gross Family Farm in English, Indiana. We're going to take a look at how they're doing pastured poultry. It's a very different form of pastured poultry than you tend to see online. It's one way I think is really cool. I think you're going to enjoy it. Stay tuned in this one to find out what Luke's doing and how he's doing it coming up. When it comes to pastured poultry, one thing you typically associate with pastured poultry is a chicken tractor, but one thing you won't find anywhere within this cell of pasture that I'm in is a chicken tractor. Nonetheless, Luke's making it work. He's doing this alternative model because it, it kind of takes pastured poultry to the next level. While the chicken tractor is great, it works in some contexts, there's ways it can be improved. You know, one constraint of that chicken tractor is it's a small segregated area and you have to move it once, maybe even twice a day to distribute the manure load across your pasture. When you have a system like Luke's here, as you can see behind me, there's no constraints except the outside electronet. This is a huge area, this might be a third of an acre, half an acre that I'm in here, and these chickens have access to this whole area free ranging it. The only shelters that they have are ones like you see right here that are just open. They go under it at night, they go under it if it rains, they go under it if it's sunny. There's no cage to keep them in. So this is an interesting model. Luke's going to talk about why he's doing it, how it's worked. I'm not going to say this is the be all end all model for everyone, and it might not be the starting point for everyone, but I think it's something that a lot of people who want to get into this space could aspire to. It's further down that regenerative continuum and it's also a lot less work. You're not dragging a bunch of chicken tractors around every day. You're just putting feed in and moving these portable shelters around which is pretty easy. So Luke we're walking through your pasture here. We're heading back to your pastured poultry enterprise. You know for you why pastured poultry? It definitely has the demand. You mentioned that when you were talking about pork. More people eat chicken than poultry but from a farm context standpoint it's not just enough to have the economics work. How does it fit into the rest of the system? Yeah, well, we're, we're walking right across um, my hay field. And when we moved here, the hay field was kind of, um, kind of cropped out. Um, the family that, that we bought the farm from, they would pull hay from here and feed it at the front of the farm. And so a lot of the nutrients that were in this pasture were transported up there. Um, and so after eight years of that, there needs to be some some remineralization here of of, uh, of our pastures, and they've done a, a whole lot of benefit in that regard. The way we do the like, pasture, like you visually noticed it, you would just say, yeah, very much so. Even just over here, um, we can walk through there later. But there's way more dark green areas and more lush growth. It's even started to fill in a little bit in some places where that have gotten a little bit patchy. Um, so even in our first year of having poultry on much of this land, we've seen a lot of improvement on that pasture. Um, and the clovers seem to be coming back in a lot better too, as well as the orchard grass filling out. So we're really pleased with that. And then, um, yeah, the, I think we'll have more, more grass for the sheep will be the biggest benefit aside from, from having the, the, um, the profit. You know, Luke, we're standing in front of your pastured poultry operation. You're doing it differently than a Salatin would, different than Darby would. You're doing a free range system. Can you talk about how that's working or what the basics of that system are first? Sure, yeah. Um, this is our second year doing poultry. And so we're trying to kind of hone down what works best. But as you can probably see, we've got red birds. Um, we finish these out in about 10 weeks as opposed to the typical, I guess, seven or eight that a lot of people will do with Cornish. We start them out in these chicken tractors. Um, we can load them in a little bit tighter than most people because they're, uh, they're not going to be stuck in there for very long. They're coming out of the brooder into a chicken tractor, probably about 150 chicks per, per, per chicken tractor, but then within a week or two after that, at age three and a half, four and a half weeks of age, um, we'll just prop up a bucket underneath one corner of the chicken tractor and we'll let them roam out in the, in the area um, around with the um, electronetting and they can choose whether to go in or out and they, they kind of learn where, where the safest, best place is for them. Uh, the electronetting keeps the predators at bay pretty well, um, which would be a big concern. We don't have so much problem with aerial predators as I guess other people tend to, um, at least we haven't thus far. And then we'll, uh, we'll transition them into these kind of open-sided um, shelters, um, sort, of, sort of ramshackle what we've cobbled together. Three shelters will drag around the pasture and it'll provide shade or protection from, from cold rainy days. One thing I noticed in looking at these, like there's no fencing around them. It's literally just a roof 
mm -hmm. and that that's not an issue for you at all. Good. Yeah, no walls, partially just to keep keep it light and portable. Um, you know, my my pregnant wife can move them around as she needs to, um, and so we really like that part of the system. Uh, but we, yeah, there's no need for the walls, so we just strip that out for the last half of their life, basically, um, and we'll just we'll just give them the ability. There's some roost; they'll sometimes roost in them, but but basically, um, we just pull those around, and and if we pull that and the feeders and the waters forward together, they just generally kind of march down the section, and then we'll give them a new section of fence around them um, when when they've finish that time there. They can go forwards or backwards if they need to. For brooding, you said you're brooding them on pasture in the chicken tractor? Uh, we're not. I've, I've actually thought about moving towards that. Um, I know that you've talked to Greg who does that and actually I, I spoke with him last winter and kind of briefly entertained the idea of doing so and we might next year at least in the summer months but uh, but right now we're we're doing kind of traditional sawdust in the in the garage um, brooder and uh, and we're 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 planning to keep that going, maybe give it a try. But yeah, we, we bring them out here after they're done brooding at two and a half weeks, you know, depending on weather, stuff like that. And looking at this operation, it's obviously less work than say a traditional pasture poultry because you're not dragging a chicken tractor around every day. How often are you moving the fencing on these cells? It varies depending, our, our land has topography and existing fences to where we kind of, um, it's not every paddock's the same size, but uh, four to seven days we're moving the fencing around something like that typically uh, and sometimes we'll even pull a panel off the back and add it to the front but we're not moving the whole paddock all together at once um, so every four to seven days we're moving some fencing we do cut out some labor with the chicken tractor moves um, but but there is a lot of labor catching up the chickens is, is a bit more difficult we're trying to hone that system down we have some neighbors um, who help us out with that um, but there's there's a few points in the system I'm trying to trying to hone down and get better but we're it's a it's a work in progress but so far we really do like it um, we like we like the, the way the chickens get to live um, the, the chicken tastes great they're having access to a lot of forage we're trying to maximize their access to forage with the red birds I, I've never raised white birds but they are um, they're supposed to be a little more athletic and more willing to get out there and forage I haven't done side-by-side -side trials so I can't I can't poo-poo anyone else's birds or anything like that but the numbers work for you the numbers work yeah um, we we uh, we we may try some Cornish next year and see how they do in the system um, but but for right now the, the chicken tastes great people are willing to pay for it and uh, and and we feel like we deserve a premium because um, it we, we have a couple labor efficiencies but I think it, all in all it's a little bit more labor it's two more weeks of the work with the chickens and feeding and watering and hauling and everything like that and then the catching up is more work so so we uh, we but yeah we, we think that it's it's worth the extra extra labor at least so far um, I'm not sure to what point we can scale it but we're we're kind of trying to learn learn those things we're doing about 2,000 birds right now I know you have a dog out here do you feel like you need a livestock guardian dog for this type of system where they're this open I think it's a good idea um, our dog has kind of learned to scoot under the electric fence and sleep up by the house and our fences aren't as hot as they should be so we might be playing with fire with the predators a little more than we should but um, we haven't had any bad luck thus far um, but um, but ideally with hot fences and a dog you've got two pretty good layers of protection there we're doing 2,000 birds a year you take them off farm you know when it comes to that should I process on farm should I process off farm decision yeah for you and your wife in your context how did you arrive at what you do um, we know that there's a processor um, who's not close but close enough that that does a great job um, and we knew that before we started but we never even really considered on farm processing um, we've we've always had more more work than we needed to do and it just it never seemed like it it would be something that would make sense in our context um, and so we're always looking for ways to to save on labor and 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 uh, part of why we like like livestock farming is because we don't we don't need to involve a bunch of outside labor um, but if you're processing on farm I mean I know you guys have talked about that a lot on your podcast how um, you've got to bring in labor and a lot of it but only on these specific days and it just becomes a, a bit of a, a difficulty um, when you're when you're getting up to that kind of number it's not just um, you and your your wife and your five-year-old processing 
2,000 chickens a year. Um, that's that's typically not going to work. <laughs> and and yeah, it's it's amazing how efficient they can be when when they've got a, a setup for everything that they need um, down there with the processor. When you have a system like this, maintenance is pretty easy, pretty straightforward when it comes to the day-to-day. -day. You're checking waters, you're refilling waters, you're putting feed in like Luke's doing behind me. You might want to move these portable shelters around with inside the cell here to distribute the manure load because the chickens are going to hang out where the feeder is, where the water is, where the shelter is. That's where most of your manure is going to end up. So even though this is a big cell, you're going to want to move that stuff around to get the chickens moving around. Other than that, you're not doing a whole lot. You're checking the fence getting any chickens back in that come out. Pretty simple. It's a low time input system. You got to think about predators in here, which Luke has done. You know, there's fencing. He's not having huge predator issues. He does have a livestock guardian dog down here. But overall, not a lot of work. And then the major work, the biggest part of the work comes when you do have to move this cell. If you were to move this cell from here down pasture, you got to move all the fencing, but you also have to gather up all the chickens and get them down into that next cell, which can tend to be a little bit difficult. But overall, you know, day to day, low maintenance of time, or day to day, low input of time, not bad at all. Luke, I love the idea of this system. For somebody who might want to take this on, what would be some words of advice, points of caution, or suggestions for doing this? Yeah, um, I have a few. Um, you need a pretty good charger to, to really adequately charge up, you know, four, five, six of these sections of um, fencing. Um, and so that's one thing I would consider. Um, livestock Guardian Dog is great um, if you can, but um, one layer of protection is, is probably going to be good enough. Um, we do start our chickens out for a couple weeks in a chicken tractor to make sure that they're adequately secure, big enough to not poke through the electric fencing. Um, even we found better luck um, with fencing that's got the three inch holes as opposed to the three and a half inch. It does make a difference when you're, uh, um, when you're trying to make sure birds don't move in and out of the fence and eventually get stuck in the fence and then get electrocuted by the fence. Um, that it, it's there to protect the chickens, but it can kill them if, if they end up you know, getting used to going through and as they get bigger, they get start getting stuck. Aside from that, um, catching up the chickens in the last day is a, is a place where we've tried to really figure out how to make that system work better and better and you, you kind of need some um, you need know, to figure out a system that's going to work because it will take some time. Because the challenge there is when it's processing day or right. even if you want to move cells, I mean, you could have chickens spread out over this huge area sure. and it's getting them all in one section. Like, say you're going to move this cell right now. I know it's not your property, but you want to move it right there. Sure. How would you go about doing that and then getting the chickens over there? Well, um, I'll... It depends on how much fencing sections I've got. I can always just build another cell and then open it up if I've got enough fencing. But if you don't have enough fencing, then what I'll do, let's say we've got four 100-meter um, sections of fence. Um, I'll do a, oftentimes I'll do a long rectangle and move them down the, you know, kind of down the football field. And then um, at feed up time, they're all going to be, or, or even if it's hot in the, in the middle of the day, they're going to be under the shelters. They're going to be in that general area where the feeders are. So as long as they're all down there, I can take that back section of fence off, close it back off, and then add it to the front. Squeeze them. Yeah, the, use the heat of the day or use the, the hunger of the morning to make sure that they're all, um, you know, down around that area where you want them to be. And then if you, it's not like um, a paddock with a bunch of cows or sheep in it where they're just going to sprint all over the place and they're way faster than you. It's a chicken and it kind of just wants to hang out in the shade in the summertime in the middle of the day. So we'll just move it at those times of day when they're, they are on that half of the paddock and we can take the fencing off the back half. Yeah, that using hunger as a tool is one trick. I find right. a lot of farmers use Darby, uses exactly. it to get animals on the livestock yeah, trailer, all the time. Or, you know, to get them to move. There's no better way. When you think about this cell, I mean, it's, it's huge. These chickens are swimming in an ocean here, effectively, of space. Yeah. Do you use the landscape to really size the cell? Or are you trying to say, you know, I want it a certain size for the chickens? How are you determining how to make that work? We, we will use the landscape. Um, our farm is cut up by um, cross fences that are barbed wire fences that were here before we bought it. Um, and little patches of woods here, or um, we'll have a we have a swale back over here. So there's there's different breaks in the land that will kind of force us to have a certain size paddock. But then also the amount of available fencing. Right now, 
Um, the sheep are borrowing some chicken fencing, so they have a little extra. We have turkeys and two batches of chickens, so we, we might even have bigger cells than this um, if we didn't have our fencing kind of more stretched with all the, all the panels of, of electric netting that we, we have right now. For as big as this cell is, how often would you say you have to relocate this cell or expand it? Probably once a week or so okay. would be about the right amount. And this is, uh, um, the cell's probably 200 by 70, something like that, yeah. right around there. One thing I love about this system here is the amount of space the chickens have. And this isn't something that Luke knew would work from a start. He kind of knew enough about farming where he kind of figured, okay, I think it's going to all work out, but I have to try it. That's been one theme that's came up a lot on this little farm tour that I'm doing is a lot of people are going into this not knowing all the answers. They kind of have a rough framework of how they think it's gonna work out, and then they go after it and they try stuff and adapt and adjust along the way. You're gonna have losses, both in terms of animals and uh, economic finances along the way, but the only way you're gonna to arrive to better systems or figure out the best thing for you in your land and your context is to try stuff. That's what Luke's doing here, and he's arrived at something that's working really well. Not to say it can't be done better or it won't get better, but for now, it's a pretty darn good start, and he's continuing to make it work. So you have 370 birds in here right now. You're doing 2,000 birds total this year. When it comes to a business standpoint, you mentioned earlier a lot of demand for chicken. How does it work in terms of profitability scale when you stack it up against pigs or sheep? Sure. Um, well, we uh, we aim for a right around, I guess, forty percent profit um, within the the enterprise on um, on chicken, and a little bit higher for that than that on pork. Because I, I guess the short answer to your question, um, our our chicken is the, the highest priced in our marketplace. And our, what's that price per pound? We're doing five fifty per pound on whole birds, pound. and then um, all the cuts are six fifty to to nine. Okay. And can you sell everything you raise? We do. Um, most of it goes to our CSA, but then there's farmers markets and just a little bit to restaurants here and there. But we almost have nothing available for those customers. You know, one thing a lot of people struggle with is coming up with a market for their product. Yeah. Let's look at just the farmer's market example. When you're selling chicken at a farmer's market, are you the only vendor there selling it? And if not, how do you differentiate? Sure. Um, well, our answer to those questions, we have two farmer's markets in the summer and one in the winter. Um, the year-round market, we're the only chicken vendor. The other one, we're one of, um, one of five or six. Um, but as far as differentiating, um, people come back to us after they taste it. Um, we, we talk about our system, people, we have thousands of followers on Instagram who, who see the way these birds are raised and but I, I don't know how many of them are comparing our, like all the details of our chicken raising system. We'll, we'll let people know our chickens have, um, have wide open pastures, no walls, no roofs if they don't want them, um, literally outside in every way possible. We try to let people know about that and differentiate, but I think, um, a lot of people, they'll, they'll try it even if their old favorite just ran out of chicken and they tried ours one time. A lot of people have done that and then they've been customers long term with us. I've even bought CSA shares after experiencing the chicken and wanting to have constant access to it. You know, one thing that you're doing here, you're raising red birds versus Cornish Cross. How much of that do you think is the type of bird that you're raising when it's that flavor that customers appreciate and how much do you attribute to how they're being raised? Yeah. Um, I think how we raise it is really important and um, you know I haven't done side-by-side -side trials with white birds and red birds but um, I don't know how much more athletic or willing to forage these birds are but the fact that we're giving them all this space and they have two more weeks to forage that is some significant portion of the difference um, is just the fact that they can actually get out there and, and peck and scratch for for another half a month um, and I think that that ends up putting a lot more forage through them because of that slower growth. I don't know, I, yeah, I don't know enough about the yeah. Cornish, honestly, to, to really give you an answer of, of how much better these do or exactly why, but I, they do good, sure. I know that much. Yeah. Sure, I mean, they look good walking around here. One thing that a lot of the Cornish Cross producers might say is, you know, Cornish Cross, one of the big advantages, they're fast, eight weeks, yeah. you're harvesting. Do you think that two weeks which is really 25% more yeah. on a, compared to a Cornish cross. It doesn't sound like much, but it is. It's a yeah. lot more. Do you think that 
cost you or hurt you economically? It doesn't sound like it does. Well, um, I'm, I'm game planning out 2018 right now and I'm thinking I, I want to raise more chickens, but my processor and my system have a, a limitation to how many birds we can do in a batch. But when you're doing 10 week batches um, and how many, how many batches can you have on farm at a time, someone who was, let's say someone was putting eight week birds in the system, they could, um, they could just turn it so much faster because because every single group is being, getting cut off by two weeks. So potentially you could have faster rotations and you could raise more batches um, in this system with a faster growing bird. I mean over in theory, 40 weeks you could oh, do bro, yeah, five yeah. batches of Cornish Cross versus four of this right? with in no the, overlap. With no overlap. And we overlap severely. We have three, three groups of chickens on farm at a time. But even so, we're still, this year we only were able to do seven batches um, with with that being the case, but potentially we'll find out ways to to shave some of that off or even like kind of get a fourth group on farm at a time, but it does sort of get backed up and there's sort of a backlog. How how much, how many groups can you manage at a time with your own time? Right. There's a brooder, there's the young group, the older group. Um, if we have any more than that, then we start getting into trouble. So, um, so yeah, at this point, that's our limitation. And so the time does cost us because it, I think it limits how many batches we can do. One thing you may be wondering is what type of birds are these? We were, we've referred to them in this video as red birds. These are all Freedom Rangers. Luke's had good luck with them. They've gotten up to weight. His last batch that he finished off two weeks ago weighed out between four and a half and six pounds at 10 week harvest. So pretty good numbers in terms of pastured poultry. He's never raised Cornish cross, so he doesn't have a good point of comparison, but this is working for him. Freedom Rangers. You know, with all this, I've talked to you about this on the podcast, there's always trade-offs. It's time, it's ideology, it's labor, it's money. How do you balance, you know, in your perfect world where you want the farm to be down the line with where it has to be now to support, you know, you, your wife, your, sure. you have three kids, one on the way. So there's some real life reality that has to be covered by all this. How do you balance that out against like, this is the perfect thing? Sure. I mean, in, in one sense, we're, we're cash flowing our farm mostly with omnivores. And when you, when you look at like an energy audit of our farm, we're, we're trucking in grain um, and it's non-GMO, but it's not, um, you know, it's not coming from a hyper sustainable system. So, I mean, when I'm balancing things, I'm thinking, I want to have a farm that is more and more grass-based. And um, those pigs and chickens are providing an ecological benefit here. Um, but when you look at the, you know, the total balance, they're providing an ecological detriment somewhere else. And, and we, we feel that cost and we realize it's a real cost, but it is, it is uh, when, we're, when we're balancing our ability to make a profit in a way that we feel good about and our ability to, to, to manage this land and steward it well, it is the price we have to pay. We don't have enough capital or land right now to have like, you know, a hundred percent grass-based farm with the with the the grazing pigs and and a hundred thousand dollar cattle herd. We don't we don't have the acreage. We don't have the cattle. We'd love to get there, and we're, we're we want to move there. And I think part of part of it is to keep our eye on something that will be um, a more and more grass-based system. I don't I don't know that we'll get rid of omnivores with eating grain, but um, but I'd like to tilt the balance more because I think it'd be more regenerative and, and, and potentially more profitable too. There you have it, Luke Gross of Gross Family Farm on pastured poultry, his down the line sustainable version of pastured poultry. I love the idea of this. While he still does have to bring in grain, every commercial pastured poultry producer does. I love the idea of having them be able to free range in this ocean of grass versus having them sold up in chicken tractors. Again, I get why people do that. I get there's different purposes for both of them. But this system, it really resonates with me. Love the idea of it. You know, one thing that tends to to come up a lot is you have to make the business work with your land. You have 20 acres here. Some of it's wood, some of it's pasture. Do you think you could cash flow your lifestyle and support your family and run this farm by removing chickens? Or do you need that economic input from the chickens to keep this going? Um, I think we need the chickens, yeah. Um, they're, 
they're probably about 40% of our income at this point in time um, on the whole. And I don't think our land could could handle it if we tried to get the pigs to, to, to take that up. And I don't think that our sheep or any ruminant could could provide that profit on this kind of land base. So yeah. unless unless you're getting into something, um, some other kind of bird um, as an alternative, which I think there, it, you'd, you'd kind of have a hard time making that amount of profit off of another kind of bird. Right, because you have turkeys, mm -hmm. you have broilers, you have sheep, you have pigs, mm -hmm. you sell a tiny bit of veg. Yeah. And I, I think one thing people can come into this space and want is say like, I'm going to raise pigs or I'm gonna raise pastured poultry one enterprise which makes sense in some ways to start out and to learn sure. yeah. but if you want to get to a certain place financially yeah you may have to put a bunch of enterprises under that umbrella of the farm at least in the beginning like you're saying till you can evolve to a big cattle herd sure or on lease land like everybody can't start there but you may have to do this grouping of more animals yeah to make that sum total financially work yeah and when you when you go to the farmer's market or wherever, talk to a chef, anything, when you enter that marketplace and you say, I offer pork, um, people may think of you and they want pork, but when you say, I offer pork and chicken, they're, they're or when you start off adding to the list, they're thinking more, I'm going to the meat store, I need to talk to the meat guy right. for all my meat needs. I think, I think you, I've heard people say, I sell more beef because I sell chicken. That's why I, that's even why I raise chickens is to sell more beef. And, um, yeah, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. And we've, we've found, um, better luck at farmer's markets, dropping the produce and bringing in the chicken. Um, people coming into our booth, they're obviously meat shoppers now. They're not, um, you know, they're not, sometimes people would see a big pile of produce sitting there and, and, um, and like a little, and a big sign with the, all the pork cuts and they would totally miss the fact we had pork and yeah. that's the main reason we're there. So it's a, yeah, it's, it's a, there's a lot of synergies that come on the marketing side um, from bringing in more of the animals for sure. There you have it, Luke Gross of Gross Family Farms. If you want to learn more about Luke and follow him on Instagram, there's a link to that below. I've also done a podcast with Luke for Grass Fed Life. Previously, if you want to see that and listen to that, there's a link to that episode below. I love what Luke's doing here. He's trying new things, doing something different, and it's really working for him. There's a lot of models out there when it comes to pasture poultry, whether that's a chicken tractor model or an open cell system like this. Find the one that works best for you. Find the one that works best for you economically. Find the one that works best for your land and your ideology and come up with a situation where you can make them all coalesce together. Might mean start one way and evolving to something different that's what Luke has done here and he's done a great job doing it I'll have more videos coming up from Luke's farm here on YouTube be sure to subscribe to follow all those in the meantime thanks for watching until next time be nice be thankful and do the work